Brothers and sisters, it is an incredible pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker. Naomi, candidly, is a Canadian treasure. She has worldwide influence. Her books are bestsellers, of course. Her first book, No Logo, and of course, I would expect most of us in this room have read the real big one, Shock Doctrine. Your presence is here today is proof positive that Unifor will be a powerful social union from day one. What we demand for our members, we demand for all working people on this planet. Thank you for being who you are, and thank you so much for doing what you do, and thank you so much for being here. Brothers and sisters, Sister Naomi Klein. The energy in the room last night when Jerry spoke was contagious. It was electric. And so is the hope that the founding of this new union is inspiring across the country. It feels like this could be the beginning of the fight back that we've all been waiting for, the one that will chase Harper from power and restore the power of working people in Canada. So. So welcome to the world, Unifor. You know, a lot of the media coverage of this new union has focused on how big you are. Uh, the biggest private sector union in Canada. We've heard that again and again. And when you're facing as many attacks as working people in Canada are facing, big can be really handy. It can be very helpful. But I think, as you know, being big is not a victory in itself. The victory comes when you use this huge platform that you've created to think big and dream big and make big, bold demands and take big actions. The kind of actions that will shift the public imagination and change our sense of what's possible. And it's that kind of big that I want to talk to you about today. Now, as Jerry mentioned, I wrote a book called The Shock Doctrine a few years ago. And it argues that over the past 35 years, corporate interests and their political tools have used various forms of crises, mostly economic crises, but also natural disasters, also wars, to prey on the fear and dislocation and panic in those moments, to ram through policies that lack democratic support, policies that enrich a small elite, that shred regulations, privatize the public goods, and slash public spending. And I agree completely with Jerry that we need our own version of this, but we don't need a shock doctrine. We don't need disaster capitalism. We need uh, disaster collectivism. We need to use crisis to push for solutions that actually solve the underlying reasons why the crises are taking place. We need solutions that deepen democracy, not do away with it in times of crisis. And this is the kind of change that we need to talk about. Now, Jim Stanford and Fred Wilson, in their paper laying out Unifor's vision, talk about what, what's happening to workers in this country and around the world as an example of the shock doctrine. They talk about how the economic crisis that was set off in 2008 by the banks is being used systematically around the world to attack the people least responsible for that crisis. We see this with a mass uh, slashing of salaries in Greece, where Avi and I were filming a few months ago, um, where the crisis is just being used to devastate the middle and working class. We see it happening right now in Detroit, where this cooked up bankruptcy is being used to attack pensions. We see it here in Canada with the attacks on trade unions, blaming their own policy failures on you. I don't want to spend my time here today proving that this tactic, this ugly tactic, is alive and well. Uh, exploiting, continuing to exploit public fear for private gain. You know that, you are living it. What I want to talk about is how we fight it, because that's what we need to figure out. And I'll be honest with you, when I wrote the shock doctrine, I thought that just understanding how this tactic worked, just naming it and describing it, would be enough to stop it. We had this slogan when, when we launched the book, which was, information is shock resistance, arm yourself. But I have to admit something to you, 
And that's that I was wrong. Just knowing what's happening, just rejecting their story and saying to politicians and bankers, no, you created this crisis, not us. No, we're not broke. It's just that you're hoarding all the money. That may be true, but it's not enough. It's not even enough when we can mobilize millions of people to the streets to shout, we won't pay for your crisis, as they've been doing across Europe now for years in Greece, Spain, Italy, France, Britain. These are amazingly inspiring mobilizations. And they're not just one-off rallies. I mean, we're talking about occupying squares for weeks. And we've occupied Wall Street and Bay Street and countless other streets with this same message. But the cuts keep coming. The austerity keeps coming. Now, some of these movements that have emerged in recent years have staying power, but we've also seen them arrive, raise huge hopes that the fight back is finally here, and then they seem to sort of disappear or fizzle out. And I think part of the reason for that is that we're trying to organize in the rubble of this 30-year war that has been waged on the collective sphere and workers' rights. The young people in the streets, in those, in those squares, are the children of that war. And that war has been so complete, so successful, that too often these social movements actually don't have anywhere left to stand. So we have to occupy a park, or we have to occupy a square just to have a meeting. Or you have young people building an amazing power base in their schools, in their universities, but a student's relationship with their school is transient by its very nature. It only lasts for a few years. So they're vulnerable. This transience makes our movements far too easy to evict simply by waiting them out in some cases, or all too often by applying brute state force, which is what's happened in far too many cases. And this is one of the reasons why the creation of Unifor and your promise of reviving social unionism, building not just a big union, but a vast and muscular network of social movements has raised so much hope. Because the desire for radical change is out there, but in order to turn it into a reality, we need each other. These new social movements that we've seen bring a lot to the table. The ability to mobilize large numbers of people, as we've seen, real diversity, a willingness to take big risks, as well as new methods of organizing that include a deep commitment to democracy. And we saw that in really inspiring ways during Occupy Wall Street. But these new movements also need you. They need your institutional strength, your radical history, and perhaps most of all, your ability to act as an anchor so that we don't keep rising up and sort of floating away. We need you to be our fixed address, our base, so that the next time we come together will be impossible to evict. We also... We also need your powerful organizing skills because, as so many other speakers have said, we need to figure out together how to organize in the rubble of neoliberalism, how to build sturdy new collective structures amidst the chaos that has been created. Your innovative, groundbreaking idea of community chapters is a terrific start in this process, and we're all very excited to see where that goes. But there's something else, too, a deeper reason why I believe, despite all of the public rejection of these austerity policies, why we haven't been able to win big victories against the shock doctrine so far. Now here's what it is. I think even when there is mass resistance to these policies, something is stopping us collectively, not just in Canada, but around the world, from fully rejecting the neoliberal agenda. And I think what it is, is that we don't fully believe that it's possible to build something in its place. And this, once again, has to do with the success of the neoliberal project. Because for my generation, and for people younger than me, deregulation, privatization, and cutbacks are all we've ever known. We have very little experience building or dreaming. All we've seen is the dismantling of what previous generations have built. All we know how to do is defend. 
And what I've come to understand is really the key to resisting the shock doctrine, is that we can't just reject the dominant story about how the world works. We need our own story about what the world can be. We can't just reject their lies. We need truths so powerful that their lies dissolve on contact with them. We can't just reject their project. We need our own fully articulated and inspiring project. We know what Stephen Harper's project is. He has one idea for how to build the economy. Dig lots of holes, lay lots of pipe, stick the stuff from the pipes onto ships or trucks or trains, and take it to places where it will be refined and burned. Repeat only more faster before anyone figures out that this is his one idea. That's what allows him to maintain the false illusion that he is some kind of responsible economic manager for this country while the rest of the economy falls apart. And it, that's why it's so important for this government to accelerate oil and gas production at this outrageous pace, why they have declared war on everyone standing in their way, whether environmentalists or First Nations. And it's also why the Harper government has been willing to sacrifice the manufacturing sector in this country attacking many of your members, waging war on workers, and attacking basic organizing rights. This is not just about the specific resources being extracted. In my view, Harper represents an extreme version of a particular worldview, one that I started calling extractivism, but I sometimes still just call capitalism. It's, it's an approach to the world based on taking, taking without giving back, taking as if there were no limits to what can be taken, no limits to what workers' bodies can take, no limits to what a functioning society can take, and no limits to what the planet can take. It's a mindset that sees everything in terms of its value to the bottom line. In the extractivist mindset, labor is a commodity to be extracted just like bitumen is a commodity to be extracted with maximum value extracted from that resource, no matter the consequences to, you, to your workers' health, social fabric, human rights. No cost is too high. And when crisis hits, there's one solution on the table, which is just do it more and do it faster. So that's their story. It's a really simple one to get your head around. And it's a story that we're trapped in, because it's the story of growth above all else. And it's the story that they use as a weapon against all of us in different ways. If we're going to defeat that story, we need a different story, a story of our own. So I want to offer to you what I believe is the most powerful counter-narrative progressives have ever had against that brutal logic. You might not agree with me right away. Please bear with me. Here it is. Our current economic model is not only waging war on workers, on communities, on public services, and on social safety nets. It's waging a war on the life support systems of the planet itself, the conditions for life on Earth. I'm talking about climate change, and it's not just another issue to be tacked on to a list of other issues that you have to worry about. Climate change is a civilizational wake-up call it's a message spoken in the language of fires, floods, storms, and droughts, telling us that we need an entirely new economic model, one based on justice and sustainability. It is telling us that when you take, you must also take care. You must also give back. That there are limits past which we cannot push, hard limits that our future health lies not in digging ever deeper holes to get at the harder and harder to reach fossil fuels, but digging deeper and deeper within ourselves to understand how all of our fates are interconnected. It's a big task. And one last thing. We need to make that civilizational shift yesterday because our emissions are going in the exact wrong direction and there's very little time left. We certainly don't have time for another Harper majority. We need to make this shift by the end of the decade. Now, I know that talking about climate change can be uncomfortable 
for those of you who work in the extractive industries or in manufacturing sectors producing high carbon products like cars and planes. I also know that despite these personal fears and those real risks, that both the CAW and the CEP have adopted all kinds of great climate policies and in fact have been visionary in the international labor scene. And this isn't some recent conversion. CEP fought for the Kyoto Protocol way back in the 1990s when their American counterparts were doing no such thing. And the CAW has been pushing the big three automakers to see past carbon intensive vehicles for many years. Dave Coles got arrested protesting the Keystone XL pipeline. That was heroic. So you're building on a tradition. But let's be honest. I think it's fair to say that climate change hasn't traditionally been your members' greatest passion. And I can relate to that. You know, the truth is, I'm not an environmentalist. I'm not coming to you here from Greenpeace or the Sierra Club. That's not who I am. I've spent my adult life fighting for workers' rights, for economic rights, for human rights, in, inside our country and internationally. I marched with many of you against the World Trade Organization, against the IMF, against the G20. And we did this because of the impact of free trade on, on workers, on human rights. I wasn't so much concerned about the dolphins at the time, I'll be honest with you. So the case I want to make to you is that climate change, when its full economic and moral implications are understood, is in fact the most powerful weapon progressives have ever had to fight for equality and social justice. But before we can really understand that, we have to stop looking away from the climate crisis which is, I think, something we all do, which is not the same as denying it outright, you know, like the right does. But it's another kind of denialism. It's, you know, just letting yourself sort of sneak a peek at a scary headline and then kind of moving on because you can't really deal with the implications of it. And we all do that. We all do that. But I think once we stop looking away and once we let ourselves absorb the fact that the Industrial Revolution that led to our society's prosperity has now changed the earth itself, then something really radical happens. Now, first of all, I'm not going to bore you with a whole bunch of scary numbers, though I could remind you that the World Bank, which is hardly a bunch of pinkos, says that we're on track now for four degrees of warming in my son's lifetime. I could tell you that the International Energy Agency, again not a protest camp of green radicals, says that the World Bank is being too optimistic and we're actually on target if we keep with business as usual, on target for six degrees of warming this century with, and I quote, catastrophic implications for us all. And that is an understatement because we have seen the effects of warming below one degree. That's what we're living with now. And we know what that looks like. 97% of Greenland's ice sheet melted last summer. As my friend Bill McKibben says, we've taken one of the great features of the planet and we've broken it. And then there are all the extreme weather events. You know, we don't really have summer anymore. We have disaster season. I was in Fort McMurray uh, in June and the contents of the town's museum, literally its history, was floating around in the water. I was trying to interview, to get interviews with heads of the big oil companies for this film we're working on, but their headquarters in Calgary were all empty, and the downtown was dark, and the city was frantically bailing out from the worst floods it had ever seen. But not even the NDP had the courage to say, this is what climate change looks like, and we're going to have to, to get ready for a lot more of it, especially if the oil companies get their way. Now, we know that this climate emergency is only going to get worse. And our excuses about why we can't do anything about it, why it's somebody else's problem, are melting away. Now, I've spent a little bit of time with the sort of hard right Americans who deny climate change. I went to this conference of, of climate change deniers uh, in Washington, D.C., put on by the Heartland Institute. These are the real hard right guys. And what becomes clear when you hang out with them 
is that they understand climate change better than we do. Because they sit around and say it's a socialist conspiracy. It's just a big excuse to intervene in the market and regulate corporations and do away with free trade. You know, it's, it's just an excuse to, to have a planned economy. And the truth is, they're right. They're not right about the science. They're dead wrong about the science. 97% of climate scientists agree that humans are causing climate change. But they're right about the implications of the science, that if we listen to this, if we, if we listen to the scientists and accept it, we need to do so many of the things that we want to do anyway with great urgency. The right is so appalled by this that they have to deny the science. My question is, where is the left? Where are progressives? Why aren't we understanding that this is the best argument we have ever had? So you wanted our shock doctrine? This is our shock doctrine. <laughs> If you believe that climate change is real, if you understand the urgency and the deadline that we're on, we have to tear up the free market playbook. And we have to do so, as I said yesterday. So I want to lay out what a real climate agenda would look like if we took this seriously. And when I say a real climate agenda, I, mean, I don't mean the kind of stuff we've been getting from the big corporate green groups, it, particularly in the US, which is all these, you know, they, they have swallowed the neoliberal ideology and they have told us that we can deal with this crisis by changing our light bulbs, you know, by, by giving more power to the market with cap and trade. They have bungled this massively. The truth is this issue is too important to leave to the environmentalists. We need you to take it up. So, I mentioned that we're going to have to revive the public sphere. I mean, think about it. We need subways, streetcars, clean rail systems, not only everywhere, but affordable to everyone. We need energy efficient and affordable housing along those transit lines. We need smart grid, electrical grids carrying renewable energy. We need garbage collection, which has as its goal the elimination of garbage. Because there are big parts of the economy that are already low carbon. They're the parts of the economy that are most disrespected, um, where they're facing the most demeaning attacks and the deepest cuts. These happen to be jobs dominated overwhelmingly by women, new immigrants, people of color. These are the sectors actually that we need to expand massively and we need to take those lousy paying jobs and turn them into well paying jobs. And we're seeing right now <laughs> and you already know this. But I think what you haven't fully realized is that that's a climate policy. That's a climate policy too. And you can use the urgency of the climate crisis to make that argument. And we're seeing how this works right now with the incredible uh, strikes of fast food workers in the United States. I mean, this has been an amazing work, an amazing week. And we could, we could build on that. The fast food strikes in the U.S could be the first uprising in a sustained rebellion fighting for both real wages and real food, one in which the health of workers and the health of society are inextricably linked. So I hope it's clear by now that I'm not talking about some, a few token you know, green jobs here. This is about a green labor revolution, an epic vision for healing our country from the ravages of the past 30 years of neoliberalism and healing the planet at the same time. So the big question is, when you hear about all of these wonderful schemes, is how are we going to pay for it? Because of course we're broke, or at least we're told again and again that we're broke. But we also know that when an issue is urgent enough, in the eyes of those in power at least, whether it's a war or the need to bail out the banks, that money can be found. So this is why using the urgency of the climate crisis to supercharge your demands is so important. And the money is there. We have to go where the money is. And the money is with the fossil fuel companies and with the banks that finance them. We have to get our hands on some of their super profits to clean up the mess they've made. It's a very simple concept enshrined in law called polluter pays. Now, we're not going to get that money by continuing to extract more and more, which is the message we get from them, right? You know, just let us keep digging and we'll give you, a, a, we'll give you, you know, the, a, a, a share of it. The truth is we can't do that because what the science tells us is that we need to keep 80% of their proven reserves in the ground if we're going to stay below two degrees warming. Once again, I'm not going to get into the science. It's out there. 
you know it. It's called the carbon bubble or stranded assets. These companies have, have five times more carbon on their books in their proven reserves than the atmosphere can absorb and stay below two degrees. So they've essentially, their business model declares war on life on Earth, and we just can't leave it to them. So we need to take less out and we need to keep more. We need to keep more of the profits. And there's lots of ways of doing that. There's carbon taxes, there's higher royalties, those are the obvious ones. There's financial transaction taxes, which we've been talking about forever. There's raising corporate taxes across the board. There's closing loopholes. There's at least getting rid of the subsidies and so on. But once you start adopting a few of those policies, then digging holes isn't the only option on the table. And the CCPA did a really useful little study last year, Mark Lee wrote the study, um, looking at the, 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 en the Enbridge Northern Gateway Pipeline, and, which you know, Enbridge put $5 billion on the table and a few thousand jobs and said, you know, this is an economic plan. Well, what, what Mark did is he you know, crunched the numbers and he figured out that if you spent that money on the pipeline, you get mostly short-term construction jobs, and of course you create costs, you create public costs, you do what these companies do so well. They privatize their profits and they externalize their costs, and those costs are the cost of potential spills, but they're also the cost of climate change itself. Um, so, he, so that's one route. Um, if you spend the money on public transit, on the other hand, building, on building retrofits, on renewable energy, you get, at the very least, three times as many jobs, and at the high end, he calculated that you could get 36 times as many jobs. So, obviously one route makes a lot more sense. The issue is that Enbridge was the only one putting $5 billion on the table. The Harper government wasn't putting $5 billion on the table for a green transition, so there was nothing to compete with them. So, I think this is one of the things that environmentalists, you know, and I include myself in this category because I've been very involved in the pipeline fights. We haven't done a good enough job when we say no to one of these projects of saying yes at the same time, putting a concrete plan for how we raise the equivalent amount of money. Mark calculated that if there was a modest carbon tax um, of $10 a ton, then that would raise, amazingly enough, $5 billion. But not just once it would raise $5 billion every year so that we could put that money into that kind of a green transition is, is that this transition needs to be publicly managed and that means everything from new crown corporations in energy to a huge redistribution of power infrastructure and investment a democratically controlled decentralized energy system operated in the public interest this agenda is increasingly being called energy democracy sean sweeney from the global labor institute at cornell which is doing really the most visionary work in this area is here today um, and he's been working with many fine unions including the CEP to articulate what an energy democracy agenda would look like um, and it's very exciting it's time to bring this to Canada and the slogan power to the people is a fantastic place to start now as you all know there have been some modest attempts by provincial governments to play a more activist role in in having some kind of a green transition and saying no to doubling down on dirty energy. And what we're starting to see in those cases is very disturbing because in the provinces where governments have taken the most positive and boldest actions, they're starting to get dragged into trade court. And that brings me to the last piece of the real progressive climate agenda and that's that it's time to rip up these so-called free trade deals once and for all. And, and we sure as hell cannot be signing new ones. The logic of free trade is now directly blocking us from making the specific changes that we need to reduce our emissions in the face of the climate threat. A, a quick, quick uh, couple of examples. Ontario's green energy plan, now it's far from perfect but it has a very sensible by local provision that unions fought for so that wind and solar projects in Ontario can actually deliver jobs and economic benefits to local communities. The, you know, the sort of basic just transition principle. Well, the World Trade Organization decided that this measure was illegal. Um, the CAW is already in a coalition fighting back. 
but more green policies are going to face these precise kinds of corporate challenges because we've locked ourselves into these trade deals. Another example, Quebec has banned fracking, a courageous move um, which has now been taken up by two governments. But now... But now we have a U.S. drilling company, um, although it's, it, it's actually based in Canada, but it's, it's a U.S. drilling company is planning to sue Canada for $250 million under NAFTA's Chapter 11, claiming that the fracking ban interferes with its, quote, valuable right to mine for oil and gas under the St. Lawrence River. So we should have seen this coming. A WTO official was quoted almost a decade ago saying that the WTO challenges, quote, almost any measure to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. You can have a WTO challenge against any measure to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In other words, these maniacs think that trade should trump the health of the planet itself. They've decided this. We've had a lot of reasons to fight free trade in the past. I believe this one trumps them all. I believe this is the winning argument. I believe this shuts them down once and for good if we really get behind it. We can't wait for governments to give us permission to start this transition because they have locked themselves in. We're going to fight those battles, but as we fight those battles, we need to start building demonstration sites because I think a big part of the reason why we don't really believe these alternatives are possible is that we, there are so many people who have never seen it in their lifetime, so they need to start seeing it. So next time there's a big factory closure, and unfortunately there will be another one, and if that factory is making fossil fuel heavy machinery, whether cars or tractors or airplanes, how about if we don't let them do it? How about if we do what workers from Argentina to Greece to Chicago are doing and occupy the factory? You know, Sam Gindin proposed this when, the, when two of the big three went into bankruptcy, that they should be turned into green worker co-ops, go beyond negotiating a last sad severance, demand that the resources from companies and governments go to building the new economy that we need right here and now, whether that's electric trains, whether that's windmills. Watch that factory turn into a beacon for social movements across this country, students, anti-poverty activists, First Nations, all working together to fulfill that vision. That's what those occupied factories can become. Climate change is not your enemy. It's not a threat to, you, to your jobs. It is a threat to all of us, but it's also a tool. Pick it up. Use it to demand the supposedly impossible. That is how we shift the battle of forces in this country. If Unifor becomes a voice for a boldly different economic vision, one that provides solutions to the attacks on working people, on poor people, and the attacks on the earth itself, then there will be no worries about the continued relevance of the labor movement. You can be sure of that. You will be on the front lines of the fight for the future. And everyone else, including the opposition parties, will fall in line. Now, I believe that a key part of, of, of achieving this shift is deepening your alliances with First Nations, whose, consti who, whose constitution, constitutionally guaranteed title to land and resources is the biggest legal barrier Harper faces to his vision of Canada as an extraction and export machine. He wants to turn this country into a sacrifice zone. And to quote my friend uh, Clayton Thomas Mueller, who's been at the forefront um, of, the, of the, the, the battle to, to bring a more sane economic model to the Tar Sands region, he says, imagine if the workers and First Nations people actually joined forces in a meaningful coalition, the rightful owners of the land side by side with the people working the mines and the pipeline coming together to demand another model. People in the earth on one side, predatory capitalism on the other. The Harper Tories wouldn't know what hit them. That is real power. Now, this is more than just these kinds of strategic alliances. They've got the legal rights, you've got the human power. It's not just that. It's that 
we need, as I said, our own story, a different story. And as we develop that story to counter Harper's one about endless extraction, we need to learn from the indigenous worldview. It's a worldview that tells us that you can't just take, but you have to give back whenever you harvest, that five-year plans are for kids, and that grown-ups think about seven generations, and that tell us that we are all connected. Because when we build these deep coalitions, we have to identify those threads that connect us all and that tell us that it's not even just about joining all of our different struggles, but realizing that in some way this is all one struggle. We are starting to realize that we have not only had enough, but there is enough. To quote Evo Morales, there is enough for all of us to live well. There just isn't enough for some of us to live better and better and better. To close off, I want to read an excerpt from your Constitution, from Article 2. I think some of you have heard it already, but it bears repeating. Our goal is, transforma is, is transformative, to reassert common interest over private interest. Our goal is to change our workplaces and our world. Our vision is compelling. It is to fundamentally change the economy with equality and social justice restore and strengthen our democracy, and achieve an environmentally sustainable future. This is the basis of social unionism, a strong and progressive union culture, and a commitment to work in common cause with other progressives in Canada and around the world. Brothers and sisters, all I would add is don't say it if you don't mean it, because we really, really need you to mean it. Thank you.